Okay. Well, uh, as we get a, an opportunity to come together this morning, I want to take a, a, a moment for us to uh, maybe just uh, close our eyes, and I want to invite you just to come into a heart of meditation. And this is a weekend that um, comes into a very special day, that one that um, touched all of our hearts several years ago on September 11th of 2001. So God, as we come together and remember the past, we thank you that through the days since then that you have been able to help us in mending our broken hearts. There are families that are still affected so deeply, Lord, that need so much still to help bind the wounds. Lord Jesus, you called us instead of having a temperament of anger that we are to pray for our enemies, that we are to, in the midst of the challenges that we see, that despite their desire not to want peace and tranquility amongst the world, that Lord, you call us to still be in prayer. So we pray for those, Lord, who are misguided in our world. We pray for those that are hurting today. We pray for those that continue to remember this event. And we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would continue to guide and lead all of us to that day would come that, as Isaiah says, that we would beat down our swords and our plowshares, the day that the lion shall lay down again with the lamb, that there would be peace on earth. So, Lord, we want to thank those that uh, continue to serve around the globe on our behalf and our military as civilians to try to bring peace to the world. We pray for our president, our leaders of the world, and we ask, Lord, for guidance that the struggles of power, the struggles of destruction would all be put away and that we would become truly one people, one nation under God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, I want to tell you an old Jewish uh, proverb. A rabbi goes and uh, says to the Lord, he says, Lord, I, I want to know what community is. And the Lord says, well, I'm going to take you to the, uh, the, to the gates of hell. And the Lord takes this rabbi down into hell, and, and he opens up this door that goes into this massive room, and there's this huge round table that's there with chairs all around, and there are people sitting in all those chairs, and they're wasting and withering away to nothing. They're malnourished. They're not happy. They're grinding their teeth. They're crying out in pain. And, and in the middle of this table is this beautiful, beautifully placed pot of stew that looks so edible. And everyone that's around this table in hell has this very long spoon that can reach that bowl of stew, but because their spoon is so long, they can't feed themselves. And they keep trying to feed themselves, and, and that's why they are withering away to nothing. And the Lord looks at the rabbi and says, let me take you to heaven now. And they go to heaven, and he opens up a door to this large room, and there's this round table. And there are people, just like in hell, that were sitting around this table. And, but these people are different. They're, they're happy. They're excited. They're joking. They're sharing. They're, they're well-nourished. They're well-fed. And in the middle of the table is this bowl of large stew. And yes, just as in hell and heaven, they had these long spoons. And the rabbi is perplexed. He said, but I don't understand. It's the same table. It's similar number of people. It's the same utensils. It's the same bowl of stew. But in hell, it's, it's, it's just not working. But in heaven it is. And the Lord said, this is the lesson. In heaven, they've learned how to feed each other. And that's why they can eat. You know, that's really what community is, isn't it? It's, it's um, coming together and learning how to, how to feed one another. It's, it's coming together in those opportunities. But yet, if we were to be real and we were to look at the world, the, the world doesn't really teach that about community. In fact, the, the more research that I do and the more things that I look into and I see that are happening in the world, uh, we have a society that really wants to push us into being lonely. We have a society that, that basically says that the, that the golden rule is do unto others and run. 
It's a, a, a society that basically brings us into this category that says he who has the most toys does win. And it's individualism and it's loneliness, and it's breaking down in community. In fact, you know, as we take a look at a lot of the indicators as to why our communities aren't very well set, there's a couple of uh, strategic things that come into play. And the first one is it's, it's, a, changing, it's a changing family. You know, back in, in the days that uh, some of us were born, we, we kind of saw what was called the extended family, where grandma and grandpa and mom and dad and, and the children uh, all lived in, in one home. And that was my dad's generation up in North Florida, where they all came together. And then my generation became what was called the nuclear family. And the nuclear family where, is where there's a mom and there's a dad and the kids, and they live in a home. So we've gone from the extended generation or the multiple generation to the nuclear family. And then in today's world, just because of uh, all the challenges that that people are faced with today and the bombardment that happens in relationships, we, I don't like the term, but the term that sociologists call it is the, is the broken generation. And that's where we have single moms and single dads raising families. And, and that's where uh, we begin to see a lot of the challenges that are happening in that and blended families coming together. So even our society, the way we look at family has changed and it breeds into loneliness. Uh, we also see a disappearance of our neighborhoods. You know, back in the day, you, you'd see neighborhoods and you'd have uh, people coming together in, in cul-de-sacs. And, and if your neighbor's paper was um, out, uh, I only know one guy that still does this. He, your neighbor's paper's out, they'll go and they'll take it and they'll bring it to your front door. But today, we look at all of our planned communities and what's happening. Not only are they building new homes, but what's the first thing that goes up? The privacy fence. And we begin to see that we're a people that, that is really thriving more on, on being a private people, that, that we're not even interacting with our neighbors the way that we used to. Then we see a, a fragmentation of our lives, and it used to be that we knew um, the people around us. It, it used to be that we went to church together. It, it meant that maybe we worked together, we carpooled, and, and the neighborhood was brought together and all of those different kinds of things. But, but now, all of a sudden, today, uh, we live very fragmented lives. And the lives that many of us lead today are so far from what Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47 calls having everything in common and doing life together, so to speak. We also find that um, what's bringing loneliness is what I call the uh, spectator culture. Now, the spectator culture is brought about by technology with computers and large screen TVs and, and video games. And, and next thing you know, we're finding ourselves in front of our televisions watching a lot of TV. We're watching every sporting event that comes. We're dialing into channels where we're not just watching one football game, but 12 at one time on a multi-screen tasking kind of thing. Our young folks are playing video games, and instead of interacting together, instead of doing things together, we find ourselves uh, basically losing sight of what it means to relate to one another. And that brings about loneliness. Then we have our social values. Our social values are in a major way. They're, they're tearing down um, how we do life together. And our social values are affecting and bringing in uh, what I would call um, fragmentation of our relationships. And the social values have us kind of pent on this one thought that, that in order to pursue the American dream, we tell ourselves, that we have to work long extended hours and that we have to move anywhere in the country that's going to pay us the highest salary to where we can go. And we began to start seeing that instead of growing up and living and, and spending your life in one community, we're, we're more transient today and we're, we're more of a part where we come from all sorts of things. We're a melting pot. And whenever you become a melting pot, you lose and fracture old friendships and relationships and family connections because now you're living pursuing something else. And the last one we see is even expectations in our church community. And the expectations of our church community are when, when we begin to see things that, that uh, we, we don't agree with, like a worship war, which a lot of churches go through. Is it, is it an organ or is it a guitar? And those are worship wars. And, or do we go through par, par, parts where we begin to start thinking about, you know, in, is, is the church becoming relevant or should it stay still? And all of a sudden our, our souls and our, our minds begin to fracture and we leave our church community and that severs relationships and we go to other church communities. And then all of a sudden we find out a couple months down the road that that new church community that we've gone to is now starting to become like the old one that we left. And we begin to start to see that all these things create loneliness in the, in the, in the challenges that we see. 
Well, last week I was teaching on um, Acts 2, 42 to 47, and I said that that, that truly is the blueprint. Now, I want to ask a, a very important question this morning because this, the answer to this question is going to be the launching pad for what we do as a church. How many of you honestly believe that the words in the Bible are the words of God? Okay. So there's an overwhelming majority that believes that. So, so if we go back to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, then that becomes the foundation of how the Scripture says that we are to be a community of faith together. Let me reread and recapture what we did last week as we looked in, in Acts chapter, chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, do you see that? They devoted themselves to understanding God's Word. They understood themselves to, to begin what we would call read the Bible today. They began to search and endure and instruct and learn what it meant to be an apostle. They, they were together in fellowship. They broke bread and they prayed for one another. So they are establishing a sense of community. Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. How many of the believers does it say? All the believers were together and had everything in what? Common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. That piece is very important, and I pointed it out last week. That is the corporate worship piece. That says that there's a time where we, as the body of Christ, come together for corporate worship, where we praise God just like we are at this service right now. But then it says that they broke bread in their homes, they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. They then moved to a time during the week where they went into a smaller location where they began to love on each other. They began to learn together. They began to ask all those important questions that you just feel very awkward to ask when you're in a room with a thousand people. And they began to grow. And it says they praised God, had enjoying the favor of all the people, and God added to their number daily those who were being saved. So we began to see the framework. We began to see, and if we truly believe that the Bible is the Word of God, then we cannot ignore what we learn in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And we began to see the foundation. You know, we call that here now at St. Paul, we call it source groups. Meeting together during the week with a smaller number of people. Last week I shared with you, eight to ten people. Now, someone asked me last week, great question, why are we calling them source groups? Because we truly believe that God is the source of all things. And therefore, when we come together pursuing God in all things, pursuing the source, then we then see that we get connected or we become energized through the power of Christ. Do you see how that all plays together? And as we come together in those groups, we begin to have the ability to ask the questions that we want to ask. On a Sunday morning service, you know, what would really blow your minds would be that, that as I was giving a sermon, I would love for you to, to interact with me. But yet we're taught in our churches we're not allowed to do that. The talking head has to speak to us. But it's at, it's at in those smaller groups where, where we can dialogue, where we can ask, where we can stretch, where we can grow. And that's the piece that we see that's coming out of the Acts chapter 2 church. Source groups become a, a safe haven. They become a place where, as one friend said, you can peel away all the layers of the onion and expose your soul, your very soul, to people that you love, people that love you unconditionally, and people that will help you through the power of the Holy Spirit through life's crisis. This video clip you're about to see will describe firsthand what happens in the life of something we're going to call a source group. When I think of small groups, I think of never having to be alone. Um, there was a time in my life when I was feeling very alone, very embarrassed, ashamed. Um, I had found out that our college-age daughter was pregnant, and this was not the way life was supposed to be and you feel like you're the only person that this is happening to. We had small group one night and uh, 
I had to go by myself because Bob had something else to do. And when I got to the leader's house, he greeted us with, I forgot to pick up the book and the DVD. We don't have a lesson for tonight. Let's just sit and share. I knew what I had to share, but I wasn't ready to. And uh, as everybody just sat talking that night, I was texting Bob saying, this is something I really feel like I need to put out on the table. And he texted me back and said, if you feel like you need to, then you need to do it. So we sat in our group talking, and this group that I had been with for about two years, and uh, someone looked at me and said, Patty, you've been really quiet tonight. What's on your heart? I knew what was on my heart. I also knew I wasn't ready to share it, but this was a close group I trusted, and I needed to say the words. So I took a deep breath, looked around the room, and told them, Kimberly's pregnant. My friend who was sitting next to me turned around and looked at me and said, congratulations. That is not what I was expecting to hear. I was expecting to hear groans of embarrassment and shame and condemnation and all the things that I had been feeling. And everybody was smiling at me and hugging me and congratulating me and rejoicing with me telling me how awesome it is to be a grandparent and how supportive they were going to be for me and Bob through all this. And my shame disappeared and my grief disappeared. And we all started sharing stories. And one of the ladies in the group told me how her son was a product of a college fling, and I did not know that. Another one of my friends told me how her daughter went through the same thing, and she knew exactly how I felt. And at that moment, I was not alone in this situation. This was not something that I was going to have to go through on my own. I had a group of eight people who were going to walk with me and Bob through every step of, of this uh, crisis in our life. And when I think of small group and never having to be alone, this is what it all means, having people to share life with. You know, I can tell you firsthand that that was an instrumental piece of our life together and our faith journey and even being a pastor um, to have a crisis come in your life when you're not anticipating it nor what you would ask for but yet to have a group of folks to surround us in the name of Christ to hold our hand to walk us through that and to help us to see despite all of the concern and um, what we felt at that moment to be shame and consternation and all those things to help us to see the grace, the beauty, and the power that comes. And I would not change the world at all for the little guys that are, in my, that are in our life right now. But that's the importance of what it means to come together with a group of people that you truly, deeply know. Henry Nouwen um, writes this, and this is uh, from, from his book, um, the only necessary thing. And he writes it about a mosaic, and a mosaic is, a, is, is made up of many different pieces. He says, nothing is sweet or easy about community. Community is a fellowship of people who do not hide their joys and sorrows, but make them visible to each other in a gesture of hope. In community, we say, life is full of gains and life is full of losses, joys and sorrows, ups and downs, but we do not have to live it alone. We want to drink our cup together and thus celebrate the truth that the wounds of our individual lives, which seem intolerable when lived alone, become sources of healing when we live them as part of a fellowship of mutual care. That is such a powerful statement. Community is like a large mosaic, now in writes. Each little piece seems so insignificant. One piece is bright red, another cold blue or dull green, another warm purple, another sharp yellow, another shining gold. Some look precious, others ordinary. Some look valuable, others worthless. Some look gaudy, others delicate. As individual stones, we do little with them except compare them and judge their beauty and value. But when, however, all these little stones are brought together into one big mosaic portraying the face of Christ, who would ever question the importance of any one of them? If one of them, even the least spectacular one, is missing, the face of Christ is incomplete. 
Together in the one mosaic, each little stone is indispensable and makes a unique contribution to the glory of God. And that's community, a fellowship of little people who together make God visible in a big way in the world. You see, God expects us to live in community. God doesn't expect us to, to walk life all by ourselves. And you know what? I, I, I meet with people, Pastor BJ meets with people, and you, you would not believe how many people portray their life outwardly, that they are connected with others and being loved and loving on others, when really in reality they are walking life's journey totally alone, feeling overwhelmed, feeling at their wit's end, and unwilling and very afraid to share, to bear what is going on in their life for fear that one that they call a Christian brother or sister may just in fact be judgmental, lord it over them, or condemn them in a powerful way. You see, that's not what God intended. God intended community to be an opportunity to come together, to, to bring all of those that in, the, in living life together, that God wants community to be a living lifestyle, that as we come together in smaller numbers, that we truly get to know each other, that we know the intimate uh, pieces of who we are. So therefore, as we share, we really know how to pray together. We know how to love one another. You see, all throughout the Bible, um, there's, there's these... Um, words that are used like um, uh, uh, God commands us to, to love, and he uses the terminology one another. And in the New Testament alone, the terms one another together are used over 55 times. So we constantly see this phrase, one another, one another, one another. So God has built this framework of our faith and our Christian discipleship utilizing those words one another. Here's a couple of examples of that. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. You know, do we really know what it means to bear one another's burdens? You know, or are we just uh, saying to somebody, I I'm about ready to, to have this very critical surgery. Okay, brother, I'll be praying for you. But is that really bearing one another's burdens? There's a crisis going on in my life. Oh, you know, let go, let God, the phrases that we use. Is that really bearing one another's burdens? And what we see is one another comes into play with that. We also find out numerous times, Romans 13, 8, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another, it says in Romans 12, 10. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 25, have the same care for one another. So love, care, bear. And the church needs to have a place, the church needs to have part of its structure, an opportunity to do all of those things so that we can be with one another. Now, someone asked not long ago a great question. They said, but all of these one another's, Pastor, can't we just do that in a prayer meeting? Can't we just do that in, on Sunday morning when we come to church? And the answer is no, we can't. Because again, I'm going to ask the question, how many of you would be willing to get in front of a body of a thousand people at one time and bear your soul? How many of you would be willing to confess your sin openly before a thousand people on a Sunday morning and let them know what is going on in your life? It just can't happen. And that's why it's so important for us to realize that, that the metrics that even John Wesley, who's the founder of the Methodist movement, as he looked at the historical context of Scripture, Wesley said that we should come to corporate worship, to church, uh, during the weekend or one day a week like we're doing now or during the weekend. And during that, we should hear biblically-based teaching. We should receive the sacraments. We should come together as the body of Christ. Then Wesley said that throughout the week, we should get together in smaller groups. Source groups is what we call them here. And during those times where we truly go deeper into knowing one another, being able to recognize, to lift up, to edify, to encourage, to build up one another, so that the words of 1 John 3.18 really come to be. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions in truth. To be a church built upon that kind of foundation. So why are source groups, why are they necessary? Why, why are they going to be effective? And let me just share with you a couple of reasons why, why I really believe source groups or small groups are going to be effective 
for us as a church and individually. Source groups restore relationships. I mean, let's go back to the Genesis story. In the very beginning, we know that there's something called the fall. And because of the fall, when sin entered into the lives of Adam and Eve and sin ruptured itself into the perfection and goodness that God had created the world originally to be, that we know immediately that those relationships were fractured. That God and humanity, that God and mankind did not no longer have the same relationship that they had when God originally created us. But what we also know is it goes beyond just the vertical relationship between us and God. That not only is that relationship been fractured, but the horizontal relationship that we share with each other. When God called out to Adam after the fall and said, Adam, where are you? What have you done? We know then that Adam and Eve had a fracture in their relationship because life was not the same anymore that something had happened. But coming together, we begin to see as it restores those relationships and we begin to live into loving the Lord God with all of our heart, be able to begin loving neighbor as ourselves. Source groups do something else. They, they show us the value and the benefit of what it means to work together. Now let me take you to um, our, our lead text for this morning, and this actually comes from Ecclesiastes 4. And Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says this, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. Listen closely. If one falls down, his friend can what? Help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Now I want you to think for a minute of those times in your life when you were all alone. You fall down in your life and you're all alone. It is a tough place to be, is it not? But you, when you surround yourself with others that know you intimately, who can hold you accountable, who can truly pray for you, who can anticipate your needs, that as you're learning the scriptures together, as you're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit move within your group, you begin to see a greater sense. It says, also two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So we know that coming together, there is a great sense of strength. But here's another reason, probably even the most important one. It's exactly what Jesus did. You know, we read about um, Jesus' ministry, and we, we read about the Sermon on the Mount, 5,000 men, and, you know, add in the women and children, 20,000 people. We, we read about all of those events that come, and we see, but you know what? Jesus really surrounded himself with 12. And it was those 12 that constantly went with him. It wasn't that he didn't love the crowds. It wasn't that he didn't pour his blessing and his life into the crowds. But when we really study the scripture, it's when he withdrew from the crowds with the 12 that they began to see a deepening sense of that relationship together. Let me give you an example. In the night in Gethsemane, in the garden, the night before Jesus would go to the cross, the very night that he was arrested, he takes those disciples, he goes to that garden that very night, and he begins to agonize in prayer over what's about to happen. Now, he doesn't go and say, reassemble all the 5,000 or so people that, that we were talking to earlier. He brings Peter and James and John, and he's got the 12 around him, but he brings those three in. And there Jesus says, as his humanity is coming out, that I am feeling overwhelmed by the world's sins. That I'm feeling crushed, so to speak. And he says to his friends, pray for me. Pray. And that small group, Jesus had a source group. That small group came and they ministered together. Source groups actually also help us to, to uh, discover how, how God ministers to, uh, to other groups of people. And we begin to see a, a, a significance here in Daniel, 6, or Daniel 1, 6 through 21 and 2, 17 and 18. Four men banded together, and, and they banded together, and through all of the challenges, through all, the, all of the persecution, through all of the pain that their lives were going through, they refused to commit apostasy, which means that they refused to renounce their faith. And, they, and, I, and I wonder sometimes, if they were by themselves, would they have been as strong? But because they were with other believers, that that cord of three strands could not be broken, and they began to see a significance and a change of their life. That through the power of that Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit coming in their life and giving them the level of that accountability. 
You know, in Florida, we don't get to see these things very often, but probably in Canada you do. And I know that we're getting ready to start receiving back some of our Canadian friends. But, you know, flocks of geese, I don't know if you've ever seen geese fly, but they fly in a V formation. And, and they fly in a V formation for a couple of reasons. Number one, because it's a community of geese flying together. But more importantly, is in a V formation, it requires less of their flapping their wings to be able to go the distance that they need to. In fact, when geese come together in a flock like that, they can actually fly 71% further than if they flew by themselves. And a, go and a goose will find out if he's part of that flock, that if he gets tired and he kind of pulls himself out, that the drag upon the wind and the air and the ability and the amount of muscles it takes to continue his life on his own is unbearable and he has to get back in with that flock. And as long as he's with that flock, it's so easier because they're all together working together. Now, did you know that the, the geese honk at the lead goose? Did you know that? You know why they do that? They do that to encourage him. Because it's that lead goose who actually is doing most of the work, and they keep honking, honk, 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 and they're honking at him to keep him motivated to continue the, the role and uh, the journey that he has. And when that lead goose gets tired, he just drops back in the formation, and someone else comes to the front. But here's something you probably don't know about geese. If in a flock of geese as they're flying, if one goose gets injured or just gets tired and can't continue the journey, and he falls out of that entire flock, did you know that two geese follow him down? Two, uh, so now there's three together. And those two go geese will stay with that one goose, geese, goose, will stay with that one goose until that one goose is restored, until he's well again, and they can join another flock of geese as they go. See, we can learn a lot about, uh, about community. We can learn a lot about what it means to be in groups, even from animals and the things that we see. You see, the scripture goes back and it tells us two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, uh, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm by himself? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend even the greater enemies. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. You know, next week we, we finish up this series on source groups and the importance of what they mean. So next week we're going to have something called a connection event. After all of our worship services, after this service, it'll be right here in the courtyard. And that connection event will be an opportunity for you to meet all of the folks who have been trained to be hosts. What's a host? A host is someone who, who felt led by God to come and to be trained to lead a source group. And those hosts will be available and, and the type of groups that they're going to have, whether it's a a uh, couple's group or a men's group or women's group or a young group or this or that or the other. There'll be an opportunity for you to get an idea of what those are and to share your interest level in being a part of those groups. And then we'll assimilate you into those groups. And during the week of the 30th of September, all of our source groups will begin meeting together and growing and doing life together as we initially start off with one study that the whole church will do. And then the groups will select their own studies after that. You know, one of the things that I think is very important for us all to understand, you know, as your senior pastor, um, I'm different than other pastors. I don't want the biggest church in the community. I, I don't want that. But I want the deepest church in the community. You know, I will work my entire heart for Christ and for his church so that all of us grow deeper in our faith. That's different than saying that I'm going to work hard to fill the pews. I'm going to work hard to deepen our faith. And that's my commitment to you as a shepherd. That's what a shepherd does. A shepherd cultivates the spiritual heart of, of, the, of the sheep. So together, what we want to do is we want to grow deeper, and I truly believe that's what source groups will go. Now, I, I'm a true believer that as we continue to grow deeper, that more people will be attracted to this body of faith because people will want to have what you have. So as we work together, let us go backwards to the early church to Acts 2 and build upon that foundation. And let's take the steps forward to grow deeper in our faith.